So welcome everyone. I'm delighted to introduce you to Jason Picard, who is the founding assistant professor of Vietnamese history and culture at Vinh University in Hanoi, Vietnam. In addition to hosting an MA from Cornell and a PhD in history from Berkeley, Jason has lived and worked for extended periods in Vietnam and is quite possibly more familiar with the Vietnamese archives and the currents and trends of Vietnamese history and historiography than any other scholar working today, no matter the place. I could say this based on experience. Literally every time I have a question about Vietnamese history, and I, I must apologize to Jason for this because he must think I sometimes, whenever I have a question, I just reach out to him for an answer. But especially every time I have a question about Vietnamese history, especially 20th century political, intellectual or social history, Jason always has the answer. And when I say has the answer, these aren't just off the cuff speculative answers, the kind of thing that we all do when we're talking about academic ideas, but they're always grounded, fact-filled, evidence-based answers that demonstrate an intimate knowledge of literatures in Vietnamese and in English, in French, as well as source materials from the Vietnamese archives, alternative archives, conversations he's had on the street, people he knows, other scholars that he can direct you to. I mean, this is serious understanding and deep knowledge of Vietnamese history. Um, it's a real pleasure to have known Jason for, for many years since he was doing his uh, MA at Cornell. And it's been a real inspiration to, to just learn with him on this journey into Vietnam studies. Um, he's the author of some truly important works including Fertile Lands Await, The Promise and Pitfalls of Directed Resettlement, 1954 through 1958. Um, also Renegades, The Story of South Vietnam's First National Opposition Newspaper, 1955 through 1958. Both of those are in the Journal of Vietnamese Studies. I also encourage you to really mine all of Jason's writings. Some of his book reviews will actually end up as historiographical essays in their own right and also his MA thesis and PhD dissertation as well. Really remarkable works of scholarship. Um, Jason is currently completing a book manuscript entitled Fragmented Loyalties, How Vietnam's Great Migration Destabilized a Nation and Altered a War, which examines the impact of one of the most crucial events of, the, of Vietnam's 20th century, the migration of 1954 through 1955. Um, but please join me in welcoming Jason uh, for today's talk, Vietnam's Machiavelli, Le Duc Tho, and his quest to shape the Communist Party of Vietnam. Jason? Eric, thank you so, so much. That was quite a, quite a welcome. Um, I now feel almost like uh, I should just field questions after that. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Despite the late, late hour in, in Vietnam, I recognize some people out there. Uh, Ivan, it's great to, to see you. It's been a very, very long time. Um, and this, there is a lot of material that I have to cover, and I'm obviously not going to cover it all. This, I just wanted to start by um, discussing just briefly how I came to this topic. About, uh, about six years ago, I, I had an opportunity after I had finished my dissertation to read a book called uh, The Winning Side, uh, Ben Tang Quoc in Vietnamese. And I was struck by the character, Le Duc Tho. I think most of you will know the name Le Duc Tho from the Paris Peace Conference with Henry Kissinger. Uh, Tho was Kissinger's arch nemesis there. Some of you may also know his name as the lone soul who uh, refused the Nobel Peace Prize back in 1973. Uh, but by and large in the West, that's about all that we know about him. Recently, some scholars have written um, uh, more about this, have delved in a bit more about his role in, the, in Vietnam, his role in the Communist Party. But by and large, he is an, he's an enigma. And as I read this book, uh, as I said, six or so years ago, it struck me the role that he had as a seminal figure in the party was remarkable, and yet very few people are aware of it. Um, and the, the reason I say this, this seminal role is because, as you guys will see, 
uh, his role was as the head for about 35 plus years, the head of the central organization of the Communist Party of Vietnam. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with old Soviet history, uh, with Chinese history. Uh, the central organization of the Communist Party was in all of these countries. Uh, it was uh, in charge of what's known as the nomenclatura. The nomenclatura was basically the list of names. It was the list of all of the party officials with all all members so we're talking in the case of vietnam millions of members and this central organization commission was in charge of employment moving people around uh assigning people to jobs this might seem like a mundane task but it also meant that uh, later ta as the chief of this organization was also holding the hand, holding the levers of power and as I thought about it more and more, I realized, my goodness, I know next to nothing about how power actually functions in the Vietnamese, in the Vietnamese party. Um, we've had, in recent years, we've had some wonderful books. Um, I think many of you may be familiar with Dung's book on um, ideology within the party, which it's a brilliant book. I would recommend it to, to anyone and everyone. Uh, Alec Holcomb recently published his, his book with, um, uh, with Hawaii. Again, a brilliant book, and I would recommend it to everyone. And still, I, I'm still left all these many years later. I, many of you will recognize David Marr, his book, 19, uh, 1945, Quest for Power. Um, I'm still to this day left with the question of how does, how does power exist within the Communist Party? Uh, what role do, do things like relationships play? And this is something that is really, over the last few years, has really, really ate at me. Um, and so about a year or so ago, I just started to play around with Leda Tall. I started collecting uh, some memoirs that I had found. Uh, there's some very famous ones by Bu Din um, and uh, several, other, several other people, Bu Tu Hian and uh, Zhen Ding. Some of you may be familiar with them. If not, not a big deal. Um, at any rate, I just got so wrapped up in this. Um, I, I kind of pushed aside the other work I should be doing. And I just decided I'm going to start delving into later Paul, who he was, what, what made him tick. It was basically what I wanted to know. And as I came to learn more about the power, that, the, the levers of power that he did hold um, as the chief of this um, Central Organization Commission, I realized um, the kind of power that he wielded was it, 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 in so many ways enough that he was shaping uh, the party and the direction it would cover, even up to today, which I'll discuss at the very end. I won't have a, a very much time, but I'd like to conclude with a little discussion um, about his role in shaping Noi Moi renovation in 1986. Okay, so that's just kind of how I got to later call. Um, so at any rate, ooh, I hope this is working. There we go. So as I said, all of you probably recognize this. This is, this is a very famous image of Leibniz Paul standing next to Henry Kissinger in 1972-73 uh, with the signature, uh, with the signing of the Paris Peace Accords. Um, obviously, he's quite famous for this. Something else many of you may be familiar with is the works of Zun Tu Hương. Uh, Zung Tu Hung is uh, a, a Vietnamese novelist, writer. She today, she lives in Paris, um, no longer welcome in Vietnam, uh, sadly, uh, but she's written uh, many books about, uh, about Vietnam, obviously, but in particular, um, examining the Communist Party. And one of her more recent books, The Zenith, Ding Cao Choi Lai in Vietnamese, uh, examines the party and her description of the Communist Party at the elite levels, at the very top, is one of, that is extremely bleak. But the reason I have this image of the zenith, and I, the reason I think it's so important that I mention this, is that her depiction of Le De Paul is of particular interest here. In this book, Le De Paul is his weak 
she doesn't use the name later call. She uses the name Sal. Now, Sal was actually, Ein Sal is actually the later call's nickname uh, within the party. Uh, Ein Sal, meaning brother number six. Uh, so in this book, there is a figure, Sal uh, Six, who is in charge of the, uh, uh, the Central Organization Commission. Now, what makes her depiction of this so remarkable is that she reveals something that is whispered within Vietnam, which is that Le De Talk did indeed try to have uh, Ho Chi Minh murdered. Now, there's no evidence for this. It's just something that sometimes whispered. Uh, there is no evidence, as I said, for this, but nonetheless, it's there in this novel. But I think for those people who are Vietnamese and who've read it, it's stunning, number one. But number two, the, the description she gives, which is that uh, this man, Sal, orders the lights on Zalam airfield uh, shut off in the middle of the night as Ho Chi Minh's flight is arriving. I cannot remember from where, but arriving from somewhere, uh, trying to touch down, the lights are turned off. Fortunately, in this novel, uh, uh, the uh, pilot who's, uh, who's flying the plane is a seasoned one and he is able to land the plane without trouble. Uh, so the reason I'm mentioning this is there is a host of literature. Um, we can talk about these kind of unofficial histories, uh, novels, short stories, and memoirs that depict, uh, that depict Leda Tal as a, a brilliant organizer um, a man who played a, a very central role in the Communist Party for decades, but who was ruthless and brutal and thought nothing but of himself. Then there are the histories that the official histories, um, the official histories are, are, depict a very different figure. Yes, he's a, um, you know, he's a strong figure, brilliant organizer, but they'll depict things they depict ideas of this very resilient revolutionary. Um, that's one quote, a brilliant organizer. And I'd love to read you a, dis a description of later Paul on the 100th anniversary of his birth. This is in 2011 um, in the uh, Communist Review uh, of, of Vietnam. They wrote, Comrade later Paul was a tireless revolutionary one of Ho Chi Minh's best students. He was among the most important cadre of the August Revolution and a leading revolutionary in the wars against the French and Americans. In particular, he devoted his revolutionary life to building the party's organization apparatus. Um, he's described as this brilliant negotiator, the man who defeated, who out, who out negotiated uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, a man who survived the prisons of um, Sun La, Gong Dao, and Hua Bing. Uh, so these are kind of the depictions of him as this, as this luminary of the Communist Party, this great figure who would not cow to the French, who would never cow to the Americans, and who led the way um, in terms of organ organizing uh, the Communist Party. Uh, so we have this kind of dichotomy. And of course, in the West, yes, we know about him as this great figure at, uh, at, uh, in Paris. But uh, beyond that, there's not really that much more known about him. So anyway, what I really wanted to do today, we have all of this, all of this stuff out there, um, differing ideas about who Le Duc Paul was. And they all kind of collect little bits of details here and there. They, put, they kind of give their spin. And I just wanted to ask the question, who the heck is this guy? Uh, what makes him tick? And how is it that he was able to amass so much power? Okay, so that's where I really want to work today. So I'm my agenda, if we have time, I'll try to get through some or all of this. Uh, my agenda is really to think about, okay, about him, how did he become Le Paul? Second, I want to think about him as a tiger in the South, um, which I'll get to. Third, the architect of the organization, the essential organization of the Communist Party. And in conclusion, um, I want to talk about if, again, if I have some time, I want to talk about how Paul was able to shape Doi Moi renovation. Okay. So this, this image is a, an amazing image. This, uh, I'll, I'll get to it in a moment. We'll come back.
come back to it, but this is a remarkable image. At any rate, the first section, Becoming Le Duc Paul, I want to think about his early years. Who was he? Where did he come from? So Le Duc Paul happened to be born in 1911 in Namding province in the north into a, uh, into a what we might term a middle-class Namding family. Uh, now, many, of, many official documents would call him um, would say that he came from a peasant family. He, he did not. His uh, family could trace their heritage back to Hanoi. Um, they were known, I'll just put his name up here for all of you to see, it's kind of relevant. Fan Ding Kai was his actual name, his birth name. Fan Ding Kai was born in 1911, as I said, in Nambing. Uh, his grandfather was um, a failed uh, Mandarin. He had passed two exams and then failed ultimately, I think, uh, uh, one of the city exams. This would have been in the, uh, in the late, late 1800s. He returned, he became a medicinal, uh, uh, an herbal medicinal doctor, uh, pharmacist. And he became, uh, when uh, Fan Ding Kai was born in 1911, 10 years later, he became Fan Ding Kai's uh, teacher. Uh, he taught for taught him for about two or three years until he passed away. Now, the thing that makes this so interesting is that when Fan Ding Kai was born in 1911, it means that by the 1920s, he's in, he's a teen. Um, not much is really happening when he's in his very early years, but his teen years are extremely traumatic. Both his grandfather and his father die within a span of five years between 1923 and then 1928. Uh, these two men were clearly up until that point, the two most important figures in his life and their death really struck him. What makes this all the more important is as these two deaths occur, um, Le Duc Tal is living in Namding, which at this time, many of you may know, um, at this time in, in Vietnam, in Indochina, there is a lot of, there's a lot of seething feeling against the colonial regime. Uh, there are uprisings and rebellions, including at this place, Societe uh, the, uh, the, uh, This was uh, one of the cotton factories, one of the, the clothing factories in uh, Nam Dinh in which uh, Leda Ta had gone to work. Now, by the time 1928 comes around, Leda Ta has apparently, according to official sources, has become a member of the, uh, uh, excuse me, he's become a member of the, um, uh, the Youth League, the Revolutionary Youth League in Vietnam. And a couple years later, in 1930, he allegedly, um, again, these are official sources, but he allegedly has become a, a founding member of the Indochinese Communist Party. Again, uh, we don't have other sources to back this up. This is according to official backgrounds. Um, but nonetheless, he's involved. He's clearly watching and and. Uh, very heavily influenced by two of the, these two things. Number one, the death of these very important men in his life. And the other thing are the rebellions that are occurring across Indochina. This is also a time where there are uh, the, uh, uh, the death of Fan Chu Jing um, and also the arrest of Fan Boi Chao, two great, uh, uh, great heroes of uh, Vietnamese nationalism in, um, of, of that period. Um, and all of this we can imagine would have had a profound effect on Paul. So what I kind of got to thinking was, okay, so this had this profound effect, but so what? Well, as it turns out in 1930, uh, Leda Paul happened to be at this site. Um, and it was uh, on the eve, excuse me, the eve of the 13th anniversary of the uh, Russian revolution. Um, he's at the site uh, along with some other friends um, and there is an explosion uh, in the roundup that followed. So this was around uh, November 7th of 19, 1930. During the roundup, Leda Paul was among the uh, 54 men, I believe all men who were rounded up 
as suspects in the bombing. And he was, he was confirmed at this point to be himself a communist. Uh, his, his family home was raided. They discovered a great deal of paraphernalia uh, that was Marxist um, uh, and he was arrested. The arrest, and the reason I, I showed you this image earlier, the re this image is so evocative. Um, I, I love this picture. When he was arrested in 1930, this, this boy was 19 years old. And I've always, I first saw this image when I went to Kondao Island. Oh, I don't remember when, it was a long time ago. At any rate, I, this image is so evocative. This is a, a 19 year old boy. Um, and I love just looking at his eyes, his face. Um, I, I would ask everyone to kind of just peer into those eyes. There's, you get a sense, there's, it looks like maybe some fear, uncertainty about the future, uncertainty about what, who knows. Uh, but this, it's a really, it's a, a really moving image. Uh, and again, this is just a 19 year old boy. And I think the, the first time I kind of thought more about this image kind of got me to thinking about Leda Tal as more than just this one dimensional figure opposed to people like, uh, you know, standing in, in Paris next to, uh, next to Henry Kissinger, but more just thinking about him and, you know, whatever I think of his politics, whatever he did, but thinking about him as a, as a human being. Uh, and again, this is a young man who's just a teenager, a late teen, but nonetheless a teenager. So moving forward, he is going to be spending uh, the next five to six years on Kondao Island. Uh, Kondao Island, many of you will know, was a prison island, a uh, very famous, uh, famous French prison island. Um, and he spent five to six years there. He was released in 1936. And he returned to Namdeng. Uh, this was during the Popular Front. They they released many uh, uh, many Vietnamese um, uh, political prisoners, uh, and he returned to Namdeng. And what makes this an interesting time in his life is he opens a bookshop there. Uh, now the bookshop was a front uh, again for communist paraphernalia, and also to organize the. Uh, the op the apparatus of the communist party in the region um and during this time he became very acquainted with uh I, I may, many of you may know the author Nguyen Gom Hoan uh Nguyen Gom Hoan is most famous for writing a book called Book Ben Gum uh at any rate Book Ben Gum was uh was um actually the the kind of impetus the inspiration for this, this story, Book Ben Gum, came in uh, Le Duc Thaw's uh, bookstore. Uh, Le Duc Thaw was uh, working this bookstore, and uh, Nguyen Gum Hoan came uh, into the bookstore one day, and they started to chat. As it turns out, uh, Le, Le Duc Thaw and Nguyen Gum Hoan were very familiar with each other because uh, one of Le Duc Thaw's uh, close prison mates on Gondao Island was the younger brother of Nguyen Gum Hoan. At any rate, um, they became very acquainted and this became a, a very important moment for both men. Uh, this was uh, an opportunity for Leda Ka to, uh, uh, to impress upon, uh, impress upon Nguyen Gom Hoan the importance of class and uh, the importance of recognizing uh, the, the international revolution. And it really, um, it, it, it really inspired Nguyen Gom Hoan uh, three years afterwards, and I want to move forward, guys. Three years afterwards, uh, later Paul was arrested again. And he was to move, this time he was to spend the next three or four years in prison. Uh, among them was uh, Hua Lo, many of you will know that place. And then up in Sun La, which is up in the mountains in uh, northwestern uh, Vietnam. Uh, he, while he was there, um, he, uh, he was, he was the, he became kind of the, uh, how we might describe him, the chief of, of, uh, party prison operations. Um, so he was the head of the communist cell within the prison, uh, which led to a great deal of, um, uh, 
uh, interaction with many people of many different backgrounds. Um, and through this interaction, I think that one of the keys that I see in this prison time, uh, and I just want to, I want to leave it at this because we do need to move forward. I think one of the, the things that we kind of take away from the prison experience, number one, it establishes his chops. I think all of you, many of you will be familiar with Peter Zinnemann's work in which Peter Zinnemann highlights in how important the prison experience was to communist revolutionaries, establishing their chops as revolutionaries. And then also the, the, the education that they would receive, the, the communist education they would receive. This was indeed a form of schooling. The second thing that we see here is that uh, uh, later call um, demonstrates uh, a real capacity for organization. As I said, he becomes in his, uh, particularly in his second stint in prison, he becomes the chief organizer within the prison walls. In fact, he, he allegedly organizes a great prison break from uh, the Sun Lab prison. He himself does not escape, but uh, dozens of others do. Um, and it was, I actually, I think I have the book right here. Um, if any of you are interested, this book just came out last year. I think many of you can see this. Um, it's just the Chibo Nya Bu Sun La, the uh, the the Sun La prison cell, uh, communist cell. Um, it's a history of the the prison um, and the communist uh, party within it. But it demonstrates a man who is who is a, a very capable organizer, which I am going to show you in this next section. Um, again, I know we don't have that much time, and I don't want to spend too much too much more time on this. This is where we get to the to the to the meat. Um, so when uh, when Leda Tall is released from prison in 1944, 1945, he's actually. Uh, Remarkably enough, despite the fact that party uh, histories tend to not uh, discuss this very much, he has actually grown to quite a significant figure within the Communist Party. In fact, at the time of the second, uh, uh, the first Indochina War, 1945-1946, Leda Ta has become uh, one of the closest advisors to Ho Chi Minh uh, in 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 the north. In fact, let me see if I have the, yes, here, this is an image um, in 1947 of, uh, of uh, Zheng Jing on the left-hand side, Ho Chi Minh, obviously in the middle. Wang Wen Zap sitting right next to, uh, right next to Ho Chi Minh. And behind, between Ho Chi Minh and Wang Wen Zap is Lei Ta. In fact, I, I love this picture because it almost looks like uh, um, Ho Chi Minh, Zheng Qing and Wang Wen Zap had set up this photograph. They were going to sit together and then later kind of rushed over to, hey, let me in, guys. Come on, let me in, let me in, let me in. Um, and so these were actually three of uh, Ho Chi Minh's closest advisors at the beginning of the First Indochina War. Uh, this is something actually written about by Wu Qi in one of his uh, memories uh, uh, of the First Indochina War, writing about uh, Lei Ta. He describes how uh, Lei Ta was, in fact, uh, at this point, already the, the chief organizer of the, uh, the civil apparatus of the Communist Party versus Wang Wenzap, who would have been on the military side, and Cheng Jing, who is the, the chief ideologue. Uh, but Lei Ta was already um, of immense importance to the actual organization of the party system. However, According to the memoirs that, that exist, uh, Zheng Jing and Lei Ta did not get along. Um, and they often were found to be at one another at, at odds with each other. And by 1947-48, um, the two men, uh, Zheng Jing and Lei Ta, were kind of described as uh, two tigers, Hai Gon Ho. They were described as two tigers, uh, two tigers ready to pounce on one another. And it was decided that, um, that uh, they were going to have to be separated for the sake of the party. And Lei Duk Ta, according to several memoirs, had become a, um, a man with a certain, uh, the description by people like Wu Tuhian, 
and Buitin is a man who had a lust for power. Uh, in fact, there's a comment in, in both Buitin and Wu Tuhin's books that uh, allegedly uh, Le Le Pa would claim to some of his subordinates that, that he was the party. Um, he, he would say, Bao la dan, dan la bao. I am the party, the party is me. Uh, now, of course, these are memoirs and they are unofficial and we have no other, um, we have no other evidence for this other than what people recall. And obviously we know that memory is fickle, uh, but it is interesting. Nonetheless, whatever the situation, whatever that was going on, nonetheless, in 1948, uh, Leda Paul is ordered to head south uh, to uh, help with the, um, uh, to buttress and support the uh, southern, the, the regional uh, party apparatus in the south, in the Mekong Delta. Now, as best as we can tell, Leda Paul was furious about having to leave the North and having to leave the center of the action, to leave the, uh, to leave, you know, where, all, where much of the first Indochina war was occurring and where the seat of power for the Communist Party at this stage still was. However, this is a really important moment in Leda Paul's life um, and also in the life of the party uh, for, oh, for several reasons, but key here is that despite the fact that Leda Paul might have been upset about being kicked southward, about perhaps he might have seen this as a demotion, which it probably was by being sent southward and away from the central apparatus. Nonetheless, this turned out to be a remarkable boon to him. Uh, because of this movement, uh, because of this move south, a couple of things would happen. Number one, uh, he would get to work with Lei Zuan, who I'll talk about in a second, uh, uh, who would become later on the general secretary of the Communist Party for over 26 years. Uh, and they would work very closely with for, for decades. The second thing was because he went southward in 1948 and he would stay there until 1955, he became insulated from the disastrous land reform that occurred in 1953, uh, began in 1953 and it would run until 1956. Because later Paul went southward in, 1950, in 1948, he was going to have the opportunity to avoid all of the st all of the stench and stain of the um, of, uh, of of land reform, so when he arrives south, um, I know today I, I, some of you have maybe read some of these books that have come out in recent years about uh, the relationship between Lei Zuan and Lei De Paul. Uh, when he arrives in 1948, there's a meeting. Allegedly, there's a meeting between Lei De Paul and Lei Zuan. Um, a couple of scholars have discussed this. Um, at any rate, uh, according to 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 lore, Lei De Paul arrives in the south, um, and he meets Lei Zuan for the very first time. Lei Zuan is this kind of a dour figure; doesn't smile a lot. Uh, at any rate, when Lei De Paul meets him for the first time. The thought was, the belief was that Leda Ta was going to take over the party apparatus in the South um, because that's what he was sent to do. However, upon meeting Lei Zuan, uh, according to these descriptions, uh, there've been several writers who've, who've mentioned them and I could discuss that at, at length later. But upon meeting Lei Zuan, Leda Ta is so taken by the personality of Lei Zuan, he decides that it's best that if he steps back and becomes, uh, uh, becomes Lei Zuan's subordinate. Now, this description um, is it's an interesting one, but it's really not based in, in fact. Uh, in fact, uh, there's no possibility that Lei Zuan and Lei De Ta were not familiar with each other. Uh, both of them were high-ranking party officials already, number one. Number two, uh, both had been in prison on Gondao Island. Now, whether or not they were in the same cell block, perhaps they had, they had not met each other, but they were certainly familiar with each other. And the notion that Lei, Lei De Ta would not have known Lei Zuan is, 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 is really doubtful. Uh, that's number one. But the next part, the, the second part to this is why might 
he have given away power to Lei's one? Why might have he decided to become a subordinate? Well, I would argue this, and I, and I believe this to have been the case. Number one, based on what, uh, what I read of the, the documents that do exist, and granted, I, I need to admit here that I have not had an opportunity to look at his personal files in the archives. I've not been given permission, something I would really like to do. Um, but what I, what I surmise happened is this. He arrives in the South. Lezon indeed is in charge of the regional apparatus there. But Le was a, was a smart man. And he realized several things. Number one, he didn't have a foothold. He didn't have a place in the South yet. Uh, and for him to take over uh, the, the Southern regional apparatus would have caused a great deal of trouble uh, with uh, the, the local uh, party apparatus there. That's number one. Number two, uh, Le Duc Tha was, um, as I said, a really great organizer. And I believe what he thought was that it would be better to work from uh, behind the throne rather than seated in it. And I think that's what he did. So what I mean by this, he arrives in the South. He takes over the organizing, uh, organizing of the party. He leaves the, the, the leading of the party to Leizuan in the South. In so doing, uh, as the organizer, and I, and, and I should explain this, several of the, the, several of the key uh, aspects of organization within the party at this point is this. Uh, number one, He's in charge of health care. Number two, as I said before, he's in charge of moving, uh, uh, moving party members around within, uh, within the apparatus. But, but number three, another thing that he becomes in charge of is relationships. So marriage relationships became one of his key, uh, one of his key jobs in the South. So one of the first people that he arranges a marriage for happens to be Lezuan. Uh, in 1949, Lezuan uh, meets a, a woman by the name of Nga, uh, and uh, he is smitten with her. And he actually mentions to Lady Ta that, oh my goodness, you know, I, I, I've met this woman uh, and I think I would like to, to marry her. Now, Lezuan already had a wife in the North. Put that aside. He decides he wants to, to marry a second wife. Um, and it's Leda Tal who arranges this marriage. Now, uh, in party history in, in, in Vietnam, we don't really have much research uh, done yet on this, uh, but it's interesting in Chinese studies, there has been work done on how the Communist Party of China used marriage as a tool to bind party members' allegiances to the party. Because obviously, as many of you may know, this idea of arranged marriages, the person who arranges a marriage is owed a debt of gratitude from the people who, who are married. Um, and this is the case here. Uh, Leizuan's Le marriage is indeed a, uh, arranged by Le, Le Ta. Um, and it, yes, it, um, yes, Leizuan was the uh, superior but later Le, Paul becomes the, uh, how shall I say? He becomes the, uh, the debtee. He's the person that lays one owes a great debt to. And immediately upon this marriage and upon taking his place as the subordinate, we immediately realize this, the, the evidence in the archive shows this is that uh, Lezuan becomes uh, almost completely trusting of Leda Call. So at one point, I, I, I think I have some notes here that I'd love to have put. Yes, um, give me just a moment. Yes, um, indeed. Uh, in 1950, a, uh, a party secretary from Jilun comes to Lezuan and he complains. He says, 
since Paul has come south, comrades from all over come to speak with me. I no longer see anyone talking to you. So Lazon was com- was completely surprised by by this, and he sl- and he says to uh, this this party secretary, uh, the, this provincial secretary, "What are you talking about? That's nonsense. Comrades lining up to meet with Paul is a good thing. It indicates they trust the central committee. What are you trying to imply by sullying the name of Paul?" Um, so. It's remarkable um, the way it, the, what this actually shows. It shows that Paul has ingratiated himself to Laetuan, number one. And number two, it shows actually later Paul's recognition of, po- of how power works, about how he can actually, by standing a rung below, by not being the 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 absolute leader, but by being a lieutenant, he can actually control the flow of information, which is what I argue he does subsequently when he becomes the chief of uh, the Central Organization Committee, uh, Central Organization Commission beginning in 1955-56. And I think this is a really important moment for not just, it wasn't, you know, for me, as I was reading this, I realized, my goodness, the way power is working here, we you know we often think top down, uh, but the way it's working here is it flows downward, but then upward, and the amount of information that is flowing to uh, to Lei Zuan in this case is determined by Lei De Paul, and we would see this moving forward. Um, I don't want it. This is Paul and Lei Zuan around 1950. In fact, this is the entire leadership of the Southern. Uh, regional apparatus. You see, uh, Lezuan is on the far left. Uh, later, Paul is standing next. The the man in the middle there, in the in the white, is Fam Hom, who would later be prime minister. Uh, and later, Paul there, uh, right next to him on the on the right. Uh, these are all figures that the, the main members of the southern apparatus. Um, but I'm, I would like to move us forward. Another another image of these men. Um, But what I want to move over uh, to uh, is the architect. Uh, Leda Paul is an architect of of organization in in the DRV, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in the North. So his building of this organization. So uh, Leda Paul spends these, uh, what is it, uh, six, seven years in the South from 48 to about 1955. And he returns north after the Geneva Accords. And of course, as I mentioned to you, his sojourn in the South would prevent, would protect him from being involved with this horrible, horrible uh, land reform project uh, that was was clearly, many of you may know, uh, turned out to be uh, disastrous for the Communist Party. And it led to Ho Chi Minh uh, and Bong Nguyen Zap having to apologize uh, uh, subsequently after 1956-1957. But later Ta, he returns in 1955 um, and several of the people who've been involved in land reform are demoted. One of those who's demoted is the man who uh, is a man who was standing in as the chief of the Central Organization Commission. Upon his return to the North, Leduc Tal is handed that pos- position. Now, the job of the Central Organization Commission is, is fascinating. As I mentioned to you, he was a, in charge of the nomenclatura. The nomenclatura is this list of names. It's basically all the Communist Party members. But later, Ta really shaped this uh, nomenclature and the Central Organization Commission in his own image. Uh, there's been a, quite a bit of research done on other uh, Central Organization Commissions, this nomenclature it, in other countries, in other communist countries. Very little done in Vietnam. But I love this image here. Uh, you'll notice Leda Ta is standing in the front and all of these people are members of the Central Organization Commission. They were actually, this was upon Leda Ta's return 
from Paris. And I think this was around March of 1973, maybe. Uh, he had traveled on to uh, the Soviet Union after that, if I recall correctly. At any rate, he's returned. I love this image because it shows he's such a homely guy. He's here with his family, which are all these members of the Central Organization Commission. This doesn't look like an office that should scare us. This looks like an office that look like people um, you might like to have a cup of tea with, some coffee with. There are ch young children in the front row. There's a, a, a baby being held in the third row there. Um, this looks like a very familial oriented organization. Well, one of the great things about this image, it also uh, is indicative of the way uh, later Paul was able to build loyalty of people. So yes, he returns north and yes, he, 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 um, he ascends to uh, leadership of the Central Organization Commission. But in so doing, um, he is charged with, by 1956, 57, he is charged with, the, with dealing with the rectification of errors. Uh, the rectification of errors follows the land reform. Um, and it uh, involves uh, returning many of the many Communist Party members who had been wronged during the land reform, who are renovated, they are brought back. And we're talking thousands upon thousands of Communist Party members. Well, it's Leda Paul who is charged with this. Um, and one example of this, there's a great story. Many of you may be familiar with the very first person murdered during the land reform. Her name was Min Pi Nam. She was this great, um, this wondrous figure. I know, guys, give me just a couple of moments and I'll, and I'll close out. I, I have so much stuff and I apologize to all of you. At any rate, um, he uh, he's the one who uh, who saves uh, her two sons. Uh, one son was uh, was was injured during the first Indochina War, and the whole family was left with this big black mark on their their background because of um, because their mother Nguyen Thi Nam had been labeled a great landlord. Um, this was a horrible label to hold, and her and the two young men who were actually soldiers, her sons, uh, were suffered mightily because of it. Upon his return, he was the one who, who went to them and uh, made sure that they were taken care of and that the family was renovated and restored. Uh, Nguyen Thi Nam had actually been a great help to the revolution. She had housed Ho Chi Minh and several other uh, significant figures of the party during the first Indochina War, only to be called uh, a landlord later on. And as I said, the first person murdered during the land reform. Uh, the point of me telling this story is it's Leda Call who returns north after or towards the end of land reform and is the person who is renovating so many of these figures with, who had suffered greatly because of re land reform and returns them to their place in the party. These people going forward have immense loyalty and immense feeling toward him. So what I'd like to highlight right here, um, and I, I know I need to, to move forward, just give me a moment, guys. What I'd like to highlight here with respect to marriage, later call recognize the power that he could he could garner over people by arranging marriages, which he did many of, including Lezwa. In fact, uh, this is a wonderful story. In fact, what's remarkable, he actually got a very derisive name, uh, later called it. Uh, the name was Ain Sao, Brother Six, Fu Ba. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the tale of Gyu. But uh, in it, uh, the brothel owner, uh, her name is Tuba. Uh, and so later Ta became known as Ain Sao Tuba, uh, Brother Six, uh, the brothel owner. The reason they named him this was because he was known for arranging marriages and trysts between women of the South and most all of the uh, Northern. Um, uh, Communist Party leadership. Um, at any rate, this was a very derisive uh, nickname, but nonetheless, it suggests the power that he wielded over uh, the Communist Party. And I think, again, we know very little about the, uh, the kind of uh, 
the personal relationships that uh, men and women of the party had during this period. This is what we see here is kind of giving us a window onto that. And as I said, this is a way of wielding a great deal of power. And obviously another way in this way, uh, uh, you know, this ability to restore families to um, to some some form of normalcy and return them, giving them a position within the party, within the government, uh, obviously it would lend itself to giving uh, 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 a great deal of um, uh, of support from all of these thousands and thousands of people. At any rate. Um, he uh, establishes, he builds a central organization commission. And I just wanted to close with this. Um, he is able to build loyalty throughout the party um, by this time. The central organization commission by 1960 is now in charge of literally millions of uh, over a million people, moving people around within the party, uh, which is significant. He's the person who decides where, where you go. As the head of this organization, he decides where you go. Therefore, people are beholden to him, not the party. He became the, the kind of firewall for information. And later on, um, as this is an image of, of him in 1960, and later on, at the six, by the Six Party Congress, this is 1986, this is the Doi Moi Congress, um, later Paul has has gained so much power, uh, but people have within the party, Lei Zuan, Fan Van Dong, Zheng Jing, Wang Wen Zap have come to realize the kind of figure that Lei Duk is, or at least they've come to believe this to, to be what he is, which is a Machiavellian figure. This idea of, of Vietnam's Machiavelli comes from this period. By the Six Party Congress, Le De Pau is seen as a figure who has only one thing in mind, which is to move pieces around. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I wish I had more time. I, I would love to talk more about the Six Party Congress. Maybe I can save it for Q&A right now, but I know I'm already way past time. I, forgive me, uh, Eric, I, I apologize for talking so much. I've left so much on the table. All of you, please forgive me. Jason. Um, no need to apologize. Um, this gives me the opportunity to invite you back. Um, is, oh no! <laughs> this has been an. I've been enraptured from the very moment you started uh, telling this story. It's really quite full of information. Um, well, too told. much. I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> too much. Well, I'm afraid. I like apologize I said, to all of you. We'll bring you back um, for, for. I think maybe we can do another talk from the Six Party Congress on. It would be. I would love to. Yeah, um, I would love to. What I'd like to do now is open it up to Q&A. And if there's anyone who has to leave at the hour or, or pretty soon, feel free to raise your hand first. So I'll, I'll withhold my own questions for a moment. Um, I want to make sure anyone who has an immediate question gets to go first. So just re use the, um, the, the reaction feature, the raise hand function on Zoom, and I'll call on you in order. Koi. Uh, sorry, I see a note from uh, Pham Khoi. Absolutely, P please feel free to reach out to me and I'm, I am available in Vietnam. Khoi, um, while you're here, uh, would you like to ask a question? Uh, thank you, Professor Picard, this is Khoi. Uh, it's, it's this, uh, I, I was wondering how um, accessible the archives is for, for uh, these figures and any other um, Figures, is there is there some censorship going, or uh, mm. I, well, I think that's a probably a, a broader question. So uh, uh, please, uh, please feel free to defer uh, that. To what a time. great question! Thank you, Koi. Uh, that's great. That's a good start. Uh, so I got actually very lucky, and I probably should have introduced this at the beginning of what as well. I have a student who, as it turns out, her family um, is uh, very closely related to Leda Ta. Uh, there. Their last name is Fan. It used to be Fan Ding. But the family actually changed it uh, due to uh, due to later talk. Um, it became a at some point in the late seventies, early eighties. It, it became at least for this part of the family, it became a badge of shame. At any rate, I have met with 
several members of the family. They were actually, I guess, because she is a student of mine, they were very forthcoming in sharing uh, material with me. However, your question, Coy, about the archives itself, it is really hard to get information in the archives. The uh, personal information is almost impossible. Um, it requires, uh, it requires um, uh, um, a permission from the family, which I have not received, not, not the family that I know, but the uh, direct relatives, uh, meaning his children. Uh, which I have not gotten. In fact, I, I tried to meet with his daughter and that didn't go anywhere. Um, it's clear that they're, they're very sensitive about that. So no, it's very hard. But with that said, memoirs exist. Uh, there's obviously a great deal of official history. Um, and then actually Le Ta himself has left behind a, a, actually a treasure trove. He, he himself did a great deal of writing. He was a poet. Uh, left behind a great deal of poetry. And you can actually use many newspapers dating all the way back to the 1930s and 40s uh, where he appears. So uh, there is there is a an avenue for for gleaning um, quite a bit of information about him. But no, much of the archives are still, you know, still off limits. But with that said, um, I, I have I actually have a invitation next week to go visit the archives here in in, in Hanoi, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. And I've been told that I'll be able to look at um, uh, some documents that may be relevant to, to my topic. Jason, um, while people are thinking of questions, um, yeah. I have several, but I want to start with one. Um, you, you mentioned you, you sort of end with him becoming a Machiavelli figure. Um, and mm -hmm. obviously you had more to say, um, but- Yes. <laughs> what we got up until this point is actually a pretty congenial figure. Um, you know, using arranged marriages, a, a pretty yep. happy um, organizational life with, the, with that um, office photo that you showed towards the end and those mm. kinds of things, right? Um, in fact, many of the pictures too are they're quite striking, especially the one in the south where, where they're standing on the bridge there, like the kind of joyousness of the smiles that they have and those kinds of things, right? And so I'm yep. curious, um, how do you reconcile that side with the ruthless? And what are some of the, if you were to say, here's the ruthless side, what would be the example or two examples that really are undeniable? And how do you reconcile that with that other side? Well, number one, so when I first came to this, it, you know, I, I, I want to admit that's a great question, Eric. In fact, you know, this is one of the things I struggle with. When I came to it, I had already determined he was a Machiavellian figure. I was, uh, you know, that's what I knew. But as I started to do this project, I became more and more I, sympathetic. I don't want to say that I certainly don't agree with a lot of things he did. Um, he clearly could be uh, um, uh, he cre clearly could be ruthless, but I want to take you back to that first picture I showed, the first image of him in prison. Um, uh, you know, it is a really telling photograph. This is a 19 year old who's clearly just been beaten. He's, as I said, you see some fear, some uncertainty, uh, not having ever lived through anything like that through what he experienced i can't possibly you know i can i can certainly say you know things that he did were were wrong uh evil whatever but when you look at that, those eyes when you think about what he endured prison uh two wars uh you know i think i have to admit the more and more i read the less and less, I, I, I'm more inclined to put a question mark next to Machiavelli uh, or Machiavellian uh, because part of me thinks it's not that much different than most other, most other figures within the party at this time. It, this was life, number one, life or death. Second thing, what we know about communism is it doesn't share power. It's, it, it, um, and I think some of these, I mentioned he, at, allegedly said something like, I am the party, the party is, is me. Um, and I think we need to look at when that came up. If you, if you wouldn't mind, can I show you an, an, another image? Sure, okay. Um, and again, it's, 
uh, I'm going to just go to this one. So there's this image. This is at towards the end of their lives. This is Lei Zuan on the right in the middle of Zheng Qing and Fan Bandao. Um, great figures, uh, like remarkable figures. I, I shouldn't say great, but remarkable figures. Um, and this is at the end of their lives. Me for many years, these three men had at times been at odds with each other, hated each other. Um, or maybe maybe hates not the right word, but certainly um, had tremendous disagreements um, and were on opposite sides of the of the kind of spectrum, as it were, in during the war. But towards the end of their lives, they clearly, you know, you can see it in this image. They clearly have a real admiration for one another. This photograph was taken in 1985, but that's this is the official photograph that often you see in you know, books and in newspapers, but that's not the actual original photograph. This was, that's the original photograph. It's these three men and in the back, it's Lei De Ta. Lei De Ta, I love this photograph. Uh, and because Lei De Ta was often taken out of this image, I love this photograph. It tells us so much, I think for so many, especially in the 1970s and 80s, to your question, Eric, especially in the 1970s and 80s, a lot, of these, a lot of these figures, the party itself was looking for scapegoats. Um, and one of those would ultimately become later tall. Now, um, there is a lot of salacious material about late, what later Paul did. Um, some of it probably was true. For instance, his role in the, um, uh, many of you may be familiar, but his role in the anti-party affair of the, the 1960s. He is kind of seen as the, the man who uh, led the charge on behalf of Lezuan, because Lezuan was, uh, was, was privy to this as well. But because of later Paul's uh, um, connection uh, to the uh, organization commission, and therefore his connection to uh, internal affairs or and also the public security apparatus, he is regarded as the man who really organized uh, the anti-party affair. That's number one. And number two, uh, many of you have may have already heard this story before. Again, uh, I wanna be very clear here. I don't have any evidence for this, but one of the stories is, is that uh, Lei De Tal actually had Ho Chi Minh's wife, his alleged wife, murdered in 1957. Again, these are salacious stories. I do not know if that's true or not. I want to be very clear here. All right. But these are the kinds of stories that come up. So when I so I think to your point, Eric, there are a host of stories I could tell you. Whether or not they're true, I don't know. Um, and the more I hear about the more I'm learning about Leda Call, and again, I'm really early into this. But the more I learn about him, the more I become sympathetic about what he was doing. He was clearly trying to organize a, the party. Uh, and I see there's plenty of things I would disagree with what he did. Uh, he probably, he could be ruthless. Um, he definitely destroyed some people's lives. Um, I, I do see that. But I am careful to uh, to... I, I want to be very careful about how we present this. And I think it's important, you know, I, I've just recently been reading Stephen Kotkin's uh, biography of, uh, of Stalin. And even there, I mean, he, sh he demonstrates a certain sensitivity. Uh, I don't know if sympathy is the right word, but certainly a certain sensitivity toward, uh, st toward Stalin and as brutal and horrible as he was. Um, I don't know if that helped, Eric, if you yeah, want, that's if you want really to fascinating. go further. I, there's another question from David, but I was just thinking as you were yeah. talking that, I mean, obviously you don't want to go down the path where everything's centered around American centric narratives, but uh, it seems to me that some of that double sidedness uh, also appears with Henry Kissinger. So it might be interesting to read some biographies of him too for comparative stuff, but let me make oh. sure that David can ask his question. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it, David. Go ahead, David. Yes. Thank you, Jason Picard. That was wonderful. That was just a, 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 a very intriguing set of uh, stories. Um, I want to just ask you a little bit about my new interest in Ho Chi Minh. I wondered, yes, yes. wondered if you could um, recommend a biography of him in English and let me know if there's other books that have not been translated that are better. Well, you know, 
Wow. Well, first of all, if this isn't a biography, I'm going to make a plug for one of my uh, my classmates at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, it's not a biography, but nonetheless, Alec Holcomb's new book that just came out uh, late, late last year, this year, is uh, is wonderful. And he does speak to Ho Chi Minh quite a bit. Um, and Alec is just a brilliant scholar. So I would first recommend that. Uh, the next thing, you know, it's funny. Recently, I'm trying to think of anything really new and exciting that's come out in in English about Ho Chi Minh. I mean, still the go-to book, I think, is uh, unfortunately 20 years later, uh, William Dwyker's book, uh, Ho Chi Minh, A Life. It's still the one book that people go to um, that covers, literally covers his life. Um, another so recently, I'm actually working on the translation. I, I'm excited. Uh, I'm really excited because I've, I've been in talks with Verso about the translation. But uh, uh, there's a book called The Winning Side. It's by uh, uh, a journalist here in Vietnam, Huy Duc. Um, it's not a, specifically about Ho Chi Minh, but it's about the Communist Party. It's a history of the Communist Party since 1975, but it does much more than just post-war history. This covers the party since its inception, and it, it has all of these figures in it. Ho Chi Minh, Lei Duc Tho, Lei Zuan, uh, Zheng Jing. Um, and it's a brilliant weaving together of basically an entire history of the party since, uh, since 1930. Um, it, it's truly remarkable. He covers the end of the, the and, you know, to Eric's point, not coming from a, a U.S. perspective. It starts with the collapse of the South from, a, from a, a communist perspective, the arrival of the communists in the South, and it moves from there into things like uh, uh, re-education, uh, the, um, the Bo people, Cambodia, uh, Doi Moi, then it talks about the Constitution. I mean, there's a chapter on the Constitution that goes from 1946 all the way up to 2000, uh, all the way up to the present, or up to 2011. Uh, there's another chapter on literature in Vietnam, the impact of uh, Doi Moi on literature. But he toggles all the way back in that chapter, he toggles all the way back to the 1950s. So it's uh, it's brilliant the way it, um, he is able to bring in so many sources, so many Vietnamese sources um, from literature to interviews with some of the most important figures in the government, to archives, to newspapers, um, to also to even like uh, folk folk tales that are, you know, these uh, like uh, post-1975 folk sayings, folk tales, folk stories. Um, it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. So anyway, I would I would urge you hang in there. Um, in another year, I, I think we might have uh, we might have this we might have this book in process in in uh, in translation. Um, yes, that's right. Uh, yes, he did. Uh, Peter did translate that. I would I would urge you. Yes, in, to Eric Harms. That's right. Um, I would urge you to read Peter's uh, review. Um, it's it's a of the book, uh, the winning side, it's called, uh, David. And it's not yet out in English. No, it's not. Uh, but you can go online. You can actually read about it. There's quite a bit written about it in English. Great. Thank you. I, yes, absolutely. That's a, David, that's a really important question. You know what? Yeah. Biography, man. There's just not enough on for Vietnam. It's, it's sad. It's sad. Sorry. D uh, Eric, did you have another question? Yeah, I have, a, I have another question. Um, so I was really interested in this period in the South and you, you said that it ended in 55. Um, and then that yeah. it made me think about uh, the, your other work, which you, you're working on the book manuscript, which mm -hmm. is about 54, 55. And that, mm -hmm. that led me to think of a, of a question I'd never thought to ask before, mm -hmm. but these kind of party leaders who went to the South, like around the period right before um, there's gonna be this big migration South, did they overlap and did they have like a plan for what to do with all these Catholics coming down and how to, like, how to manipulate that whole situation. I'm just curious, like he was there sort of when the first migrants must have been coming. 
And so I'm wondering if you learned anything about that connection or if there's things to think about. Not specifically with relationship to later thought, but it's clear that the, you know, I have, uh, I have like 60 different memoirs uh, relating to uh, a, a alleged spies who went south in 1954, 55 with those migrants to stir up trouble. Um, you mentioned one of my papers uh, in which I talk about, um, actually you may not have mentioned, but there's, I, I wrote a paper about it that starts with the, um, the great, uh, uh, the great um, fall scare of 1955. In March of 1955, uh, there's a rumor that's spreading all over Saigon in which, uh, um, <laughs> in which allegedly northern migrants are, are, are abducting young children to harvest their bodies for meat that they're going to put in the pho. Sorry, forgive me for everyone for giving such a description. But this was in, and this was quite serious. It was in all of the newspapers in Saigon, and because of it, um, in fact, at that point, Nordingsium and the mayor of Saigon had to come out and uh, allay people's fears. You know, this wasn't true. Uh, there is no evidence for this. I, I have seen no evidence for this. But this was clearly um, uh, a ruse that was cooked up by uh, by communists. But as I argue. Uh, by communist spies. But as I argue, there was clearly something in the minds of Southerners that would allow them to believe that. So that's another, that's a question for another day. But there were, I have a host of these memoirs of spies who come south in 54, 55. And um, they are certainly causing trouble. One other story, and I, this is connected to Leda Tal. Leda Tal returns north. Um, in early 1954 on a Polish ship, the Kalinski, I believe it's called. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, a, a couple weeks after he arrives in the North, that ship returns South. Uh, it's one of the few uh, non-French and American ships to, to carry passengers South. It returns South. The manifest claims that it had, it was supposed to have 3000 people aboard about 3,000 people aboard. However, it arrives with almost 3,500 people aboard. Because of that, uh, the ZM government sent all of these people to Fukuok and had them in detention for several months. Um, clearly, this was something that was uh, drummed up by the communists in the North. They did this. They, they knew what, would, what was going to happen. Uh, they, they, um, they did this for a purpose. And obviously, as I said, this was a Polish ship. Uh, so there, there may have been some involvement of uh, uh, international communism as well in that. Uh, but beyond that, I, I, I can't say. It's a really good question. It's definitely one to, to, to look at. Um, you know, there's 300 days of free passage that you're referring to as well. It's a, it's a fascinating tale. It's a fascinating story.